the old good day. Today is my 54th lecture under the banner of Marine Quest Solutions. The previous lecture, what I had imparted was lecture number 53, mainly to give the em emphasis on the comprehensive passage planning, also taking in cognizance with respect to you know, to help the mariners as far as SAR 2.0 is concerned and or these, uh, this series of lectures may also help many a candidates for their oral examinations as well. And that is the reason all the more I have taken this cognizance to basically uh, impart the detailed lectures so that the navigating officers, the second mates in particular, and the masters may understand the relevance as well as the importance of it. So let's go back to the recapitulating with respect to the last lecture 53 where I had talked about under the comprehensive passage planning was the parallel indexing, of course not from the floating objects unless they have been checked for positions. Chart ranges methods and frequency of position fixing and or position verification. Prominent navigational marks. Now that part is completed under uh, uh, lecture number 53. Today with respect to lecture no, uh, number 54, the topics which we are covering are no-go areas, land, landfall uh, targets and lights, clearing lines and bearings, transit headings, marks and the leading lines, and last is significant tides or currents. So uh, as I had spoken earlier with respect to my lecture number 53 that I have divided the comprehensive passage plan in parts so that I can not only you know uh, do the justice and justify all the aspects and also make it very comprehensively for you to understand that is the reason I have made the segregation white part number one two three four five and six so uh, today we are going to talk about the part two which is I have mentioned here in progress of course part one under lecture number 53 is completed so we proceed directly with the part two covering all the aspects what I have delineated under the index. So part two, which is in continuation to part uh, one, wide lecture number 53. No-go areas, landfalls, targets and lights, clearing lines and bearings, transit headings, marks and leading lines, and significant tides or currents. So let's talk about the no-go areas. <laughs> You know, no-go areas, to begin with it from the time when the EGDIS were not there or the vessels were not EGDIS compliant. No-go areas were marked, but many a times the no-go areas were marked excessively, like, you know, overkill. What, you, what it used to do, it used to basically camouflage and obliterate the required navigational information because those days, starting with a chart, we used to, you know, uh, shade it with a pencil, but many a times it used to construe towards a high risk observation because it used to camouflage and, and, or, the, and or obliterate the required uh, navigational information. So, <coughs> no-go areas, excessive you I will show you all those things what I'm talking about. No-go areas, excessive usage of no-go areas is to be avoided in order not to obliterate or camouflage the important navigational information. Now what all are the navigational information, that is the navigational marks, any information which could be of some assistance for the safety of navigation to the navigator, and not to smudge the chart like this with excessive markings, because especially during the critical passage, the master, the duty officers have to focus on the passage or the path on which the vessel is going to traverse but if you know it is all in uh, you know too much of uh, shading 
or too much information which is provided many of those pr probably are not required then it not only distracts the master and or the navigator but also leads to many a times it has led to catastrophical situation so i repeat no go areas the excessive marking shall be avoided as i have just talked about and of course <coughs> in the era of egg disc you have the safety depth and the minimum controlling or the safety depth shall also be taken into cognizance because if you mark the no go areas in such a manner that you go for an overkill you may basically camouflage the shallow uh, depths or uh, you know camouflage the safety depths prior to that of course you need to carry out the ukc calculations and uh, your safety depth all those calculations and or the minimum contro minimum controlling depths which i have described earlier in my previous lectures in case you would like to see you can see that in my on my youtube channel where i have taken uh, all the aspects that what all things are to be taken into consideration for calculation of the ukc and how to come to the uh, the magical figure of minimum controlling depth so as we go to the next slide i have shown here like you see here many a places the things are very you know uh, very shabbily ma uh, marked here on the egg disk which of course if you go to the large scale you may lose that patch which you are traversing so the scale or the scale man what you need to use has to be you know marked in such a manner that important aspects where you meet uh, concerning your depth draft or anything pertaining to it where it's a no go area or where you are you have a restricted area they are to be marked in such a manner that it does not you know smudge the chart and or camouflage or and or obliterate the required navigational information therefore i insist upon that when you're marking the no go area especially during the during the critical passage be judicious make sure you've marked all the important points and you have not you know smudged the chart or done you know uh, done a kind of thing which overkills it by virtue of which the navigator may you know get a kind of a distraction so <coughs> what i said earlier i've written down also over here avoid smudge of charts egg disk in order to not to disorient the navigational officer especially while traversing through the critical passages and uh, mind you if you do that this actually works as a double whammy this not only uh, distracts you but also when you talk about from betting point of view with sar 2.0 there are very strict uh, measures or constraints when the betting inspector steps on board especially for the passage planning because any of these negligence may construe towards a very high risk observation so please be careful and for the candidates who may be appearing for orals please take cognizance of this and do try to comply with it thank you now how no go areas to be marked i have given an example like here if the vessel is going to traverse through this passage in this channel it has been marked in such a manner that you know this is like you know if i take it as a path a road map like from starting from here to here and this one from here to here like i'm driving a car so i know i'm in the center of center of the of the road and rest everything i have to stay clear of it that is one way secondly you can mark it with your you know uh, depth contours as uh, with respect to your safety depth that okay it is the same thing one i've shown with marking with a pen or you know uh, with a with a electronic uh, uh, measures second is marking it with a safety depth changing the contour which is your safety depth and that is how it is it's the same thing replica of the same figure or the same chart so you when you're coming here you know that you have Uh, entered into this shallow contour and which of course has to be in compliance with your minimum ukc and minimum controlling depth and you're entering it so you don't have any distraction that is the main thing what i'd like to put forward as far as the marking of no go areas are concerned so the safety contour is emphasized bolder than the other contours 
if the safety contour specified by the marina is not a, uh, in the displayed uh, SENC, the safety contour shown uh, defaults to the next deeper contour. So end of the day, what I'm trying to put forward that one is you can mark it something like this. Second, you can mark it electronically here with respect to your safety depth. As long as you do not get distraction as far as the no-go areas are concerned. <sighs> Next uh, example I've shown you here is uh, uh, similar to that what we talked about that is the same thing, uh, the same figure or the diagram, I've uh, enlarged it over here in the next, uh, you know, slide. So the vessel is going to traverse through here. Now here you see that you have already marked it and uh, you have a clear passage to traverse. So you are not going to go for overkill as far as the no-go areas are concerned. So the available serum inside the light blue area is generally confined or restricted for safe navigation. So. We have not obliterated when the vessel is, you know, prior to entering the breakwater or when she's entered or when she's coming from sea into the channel. The soundings are not <coughs> easily visible, more so in the night mode. When you put the egg disc on the night mode, the soundings may not be visible or you may get distracted if you have, you know, overmarked the no-go areas. That is the thing which I'm trying to put forward to you all. No more alarms are generated when the vessel crosses the safety contour. Now, these, these are the high-risk observations or high-risk towards the navigation when you talk about the ECDIS facilitated collision, groundings, etc. Because do not undermine this point. No more alarms are generated once a vessel crosses the safety contours because you have marked it that way. Therefore, Please be advised that when you're marking the no-go areas, make sure you mark <coughs> only the relevant ones which are pertaining to your course or pertaining to your passage. Do not uh, overmark or camouflage or obliterate the required navigational information. Maybe a lighthouse, maybe something. Maybe you would want to take a bearing. Maybe you, during this passage, you may have some failure of navigational equipment. You may have to come back to the basics. But if you have, you know, obliterated those information, you may see it visually, but you may not be able to locate it on chart. <coughs> this was all about, <coughs> excuse me, no-go areas. Now we talk about the second point, the landfall targets and lights. You see, good olden days when we used to come from ocean passages to the coastal passage. At that point in time, we did not have all the state-of-the-art equipment, the navigational aids, what we have today. I talk about almost four, four plus decades era when I joined sea in 1979. We had to rely upon the equipment. We had radar, gyro, of course, magnetic compass. We didn't have EGDES. We didn't have EIS. We did not have many other things what we have today. But the main thing what I have been talking about when I'm doing the mentoring of masters to down the rank to the to the officers, deck officers, somewhere down the line we are lacking the practical knowledge of seamanship. When we used to make a landfall after a long passage, we used to mark it on the chart all the radar conspicuous targets or objects and or the one which can be visually sighted, be it the lighthouse, etc., etc. We'll come down as we go through the slides, you'll see what I'm talking about. So, for making landfall after a long passage, the following points are to be taken into consideration. State of wind, sea, visibility and the proximity of navigational hazards, the characteristics of the landmark, whether it is visible and or radar conspicuous. Either it is to be visible by your eye if it is a good daylight and very good visibility or it should be radar conspicuous. They shall be marked prior to coming to the initial stages of passage planning. <clears throat> and 
of course the radars are tuned properly and used uh, and used a long uh, you need to use a long range scanning for 10 and 3 centimeter meter respectively today or even when i've been sailing as master and today i do the lot of like mooring master job i really feel i am i get very much surprised when i find the duty officers cannot even tune their radars properly they do not know they have all the state-of-the-art equipment. They do not know how to optimize the usage of the electronic aids to navigation. Why? Number one, they, they, are, they are not aware of it. They do not have a complete appraisal or interface with the equipment. Number two, they have not read the manual. Number three, they probably are lacking knowledge because of complacency. So, <coughs> That's the reason I mentioned the radars are tuned properly and used at long range scanning for 10 and cent uh, 3 centimeter respectively. Number two, the topography of the landmass and hill or slash mountains as per the chart or exist will be captured at a longer range subject to the weather conditions, especially when there are no low clouds or rain. When I say that, I'll tell you many of our navigators do not know that when you do not need to use the rain clutter on the radar, because rain clutter, you know, considerably suppresses the radar's echo. Of course, you, you, uh, you, 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 you must use it when you need to use it, especially during rain showers or low clouds, I agree. So number one, the radar is to be tuned properly. Number two, the topography of the land, the highest point or the peak will be coming first uh, on the radar at 24 ma nautical miles range, which is com comfortable. Of course, 48 nautical miles, you'll just be able to see the, the peak, but you may not be able to distinguish. But 24, 12 nautical miles, you'll be able to distinguish and with the lights and other topography of the landmass. So you must know when to use or how to use the radar, the rain or the sea clutter respectively. Landfall with the mangroves do not show coastline picture correctly as the, the, the radar rays gets absorbed. So the landfall, especially I have encountered this many times during the, in the Singapore Straits. Now because we have the GPS and lot of other equipment, we can plot the vessel's position. We have the egg disk. It is automatically plotting the vessel's position. But talking about the era when we had only radar, no GPS. Passing a patch in the Malacca Straits where it's all covered by mangroves, you won't be able to plot a radar fix. So you need to be very careful. You must take this cognizance and consideration into account that wherever you have the topography, especially for the land where you have the mangroves, you be rest assured that you may not get the coastline clearly because they absorb the radar rays. All these things are basically constrained towards a practical knowledge of seamanship. Lighthouse along with the characteristics of light, that is the luminosity, at nominal range slash arc of visibility and height of lighthouse. I have explained that Furthermore, in details as we, as we go down in the next slides, but idea is that all these things shall be marked when you are prior to commencement of the passage. That all these things, especially during the critical passages, shall be taken into consideration and that is the reason. <coughs> Before the commencement of the passage, the master and the duty officers along with the engineers, especially chief or second engineers, they have a kind of a brainstorming session so that all the navigators are well versed with it. All above aspects to be taken into consideration during the passage, planning of the passage. That's what I said earlier. Now let's say, let's talk about the luminous range. I'm sure many of our navigators are still not aware of it be it checking the list of lights, admir admiralty list of lights, or radio signals, whatever the case may be. I have questioned and asked many of my officers during, during my sailing time 
that what do you how do you know that you know what is the luminous range for a particular lighthouse 99.99 percent of them could not answer 0.0001 could answer just with a very shallow or a vague knowledge <coughs> now ladies and gentlemen when i'm talking about this of course i know we have state of the art equipment still why we are going back to basics these things are still not redundant because if you have a good base and god forbid you have some failure of the electronic equipment you know how to go back to basics you know how to do the things rightly so we talk about the luminous range diagram the diagram gives a approximate range at which a light may be sighted in the prevailing meteorological visibility conditions the straight line uh, labeled that is a perfect visibility gives the maximum possible luminous range the diagram is entered from top with the charted nominal range of the light at the point of uh, at, at the point in the diagram where the, this intersects the approximate visibility curve the approximate luminous range will be found on the left hand side in other words that is if you have the nominal range of the uh, light in seen miles which you will see from the chart you come down let's see if i to take it as 12 and the visibility is 10 miles then i go here and see here the luminous uh, range in C miles for this particular lighthouse is 10 miles. I repeat again. First, let me read at the point in the diagram where the uh, this intersects approximate visibility. That is, uh, you need to go from top. That is the nominal range in C miles for the lighthouse, which light or the lighthouse which is given. Let's say it's it's uh, it's 12 nautical miles. I go down to 10 uh, nautical miles. That's my actual visibility. What I've ass uh, assessed, and I go down correspondingly to that. I get the nominal range in C miles is 10 nautical miles. That means the light will be sighted within 10 nautical miles under these meteorological conditions. This is how it is to be checked. <sighs> Coming to the next point, the range of lights there are three classifications of ranges of navigational lights now when i'm broadcasting this lecture this will be helpful to the masters and the duty officers but it will also be helpful to the candidates who are preparing for the oral examination mark my words because today the navigators or the mariners have forgotten the basics and that is the reason they are grilled during the oral examination for this for these particular aspects and furthermore as i'm going to come with the part three i do lots of research the reason why i have not you know uh, my last lecture 53 uh, for passage planning was broadcast almost approximately a month ago i waited for the feedback of my candidates and comrades and then assimilated everything into a kind of just to streamline this and then broadcast this so that I can, you know, cover up all the aspects and all the queries of my followers. So first we come to the geographical, geographic range. The range of light from which the observer, as it rises or dips over the horizon, it depends upon the height of the light and height of the observer, eye and the atmospheric refractions. Luminous range. <coughs> Luminous range of a light is expected horizontal visible, visible range of a light depending upon its luminous intensity and the clarity of the air and to a lesser extent on the uh, on character, the length of the flashes and the interval between them. The luminous range diagram in the list of lights and radio signal provides the luminous range of lights in miles which we have already seen in the previous slide. <coughs> Nominal range. This is the luminous range in miles at a homogeneous atmosphere with a standard meteorological visibility of 10 miles. Calculation of, calculation of 
raising or dipping range in nautical miles if you don't have you can see this here 2 decimal 0 8 multiplied by in bracket square root of height of i that is h in meters and height of i h in meters one is for the lighthouse one is for the observer so there are two ways to check the dipping and uh, rising range of the light or lighthouse one is the, ge uh, the geographical range what I have shown you here second is as per the limon uh, the luminous range diagram so you can use it both ways with the second way you'll get approximately because there may be some error but with respect to this range you'll get close to accurate I I'm sharing this with uh, my personal experience or personal pragmatic experience Now, this particular thing, what I've described, trust me, you will not find it anywhere because before I broadcast my lectures, I do lots of research on the subject matter. Now, clearing lines and bearings, what are they? Trust me. Though it has a mention in the Bridge Procedures Guide in the SIRE or VIQ and CDI in all the navigational publications. But unfortunately, many navigators, or I'm not saying many, probably most, do correct me if I'm wrong, are not well versed with it. Now, let me explain to you before I read the whole thing. Like, this is a channel here with the green, what I've shown here, marked here, and same thing here. Is marked and this is these are nothing but mangroves as I explained earlier mangroves are the plants which absorb the radar rays so let's talk about this MS I marked as mid, mid sized tanker because I'm a tanker man she's traversing through this area and she is turning Let's say she's going on a course of 000, and then she's turning to 270 in this channel. That is, as I've delineated the boundaries here with the green all the way over here, and this one is over here. Now, during this point in time, suppose we have a failure of the GPS. Suppose the GPS is not working. Your yeah, this is working, but you do not know your position. How would you do it? All these things shall be taken into consideration prior to commencement of the passage. And these are the clearing lines and the bearings or clearing bearings. So I'm taking a consideration that, you know, I'm into this channel and I have a GPS failure or a DGPS failure. I make this working. So how I'm going to do it? I'm supposed to get this marked earlier that you know I have to basically chalk out all the conspicuous, uh, conspicuous targets or objects prior to commencement of this passage so I have to basically chalk out all the conspicu uh, conspicuous objects well in advance and of course all the master and the duty officers have to take the cognizance of this so I have got this object here where I have taken a bearing because your gyro is working, your radar is working, your magnetic compass is working. You don't have a problem with the main engine. It's only the GPS which is gone, which is on the blink. So here you take a bearing that it is not less than 265. I've given an example and this bearing not more than uh, 030. So basically when you come to this point and you take the bearing, you know that you are in the center of channel. Because in this channel, besides you, there may be other traffic. There may be fishing traffic. There may be lots of other things, tug and tow, lots of things. But because you don't have a DGPS or GPS operation, something has gone wrong. This is the technique what you can use to stay in the middle of the channel. Especially when you come here, it is you have marked an target or object. This you have to do, especially second mates, well in advance prior to traversing this channel. You can't do it. If you think you want to do it 
when you're traversing and God forbid, as far as the Mur Murphy's Law is concerned, it's too late, too late and too little. So when we come here and you are coming to an alteration, you already have chalked out a point that this point and that has to be identified prior to coming into the range. And that is what I talked about when you come from open sea into critical passage. All these things are now getting summed up if you try to recall what I've been talking about right from the beginning of this lecture. So when you come to this point, you have already chalked out, okay, 340, that is not more than 340 and uh, here also is not more than 340 because you are going to come to the alteration. When you come here on the starboard side, you have same thing because here you are going to alter. This will help you that this bearing shall not be more than 340. If it is more than 340, you lie here. So these clearing lines and bearings, they give you a kind of guideline that you are not running into danger. And of course, I have drawn here the wheel over position here with a yellow mark that, okay, from here onwards, you have to, you know, turn the helm and come back to the next course because you can't do the PI, you can't do the parallel indexing, you cannot use most of the radar techniques because these are mangroves where you do not have a delineated shoreline. The topographic, uh, topography of the land is like this. So this is the critical path where you need to basically verify this before you come to the center of channel that when you're altering you have to start executing the wheel over position here till such time you come here subject to your vessel size the wheel over position because with the practical experience a mid-sized tanker will have a wheel over position approximately subject to speed of 12 to 13 knots around th three cables uh swears uh, aframax will have a a wheel over position about three to four cables. Suez Max will have around four to five cables and a VLCC, laden VLCC may have around nine cables or maybe a little more. So all that thing has to be taken into consideration. So the importance of clearing lines and bearings. Though this is an old technique since long ago when the GPS and the electronic aids to the navigation were not available to the mariners. However, the significance of this navigational technique still prevails as it demonstrates the practical knowledge of the seamanship in case of failure of electronic navigational aids. So ladies and gentlemen, what I'm trying to describe as I'm saying, I believe, I've done a lot of research. You may not find this kind of explanation probably in other channels or other places because I do a lot of research. That is the reason I believe in quality, not quantity. Because had it been the case, by now, in the last two years, I would have made 200 lectures. I don't do that. I wait for my colleagues, my followers to ask me questions. Then I do a lot of research. Then I try to make this slides, how to put it through so in a simpler manner so that my followers, my colleagues can understand this. <coughs> Next is the transit headings, marks and leading lines. Now leading lines have been there in existence since for much more than, you know, uh, four decades or more. But today, because of the over-reliance of a navigator on electronic aids to navigation, they don't realize the importance of it. The leading, uh, the transit heads, uh, heading mark and leading lines do give you a lot of importance. I do have a lot of importance. Besides putting the vessel on track, you can also ascertain gyro error immediately. Likewise, likewise, if you are alongside and your headlines and stern lines, spring lines are all tight and you're parallel to the berth, you can still ascertain the gyro error. You don't have to take a moon observation or a sun observation, which many navigators may not be aware of it. Just put the parallel ruler and find the bearing of the jetty and make sure your, your vessel is absolutely alongside to the fenders, you can ascertain the gyro error before the pilot boats. 
Likewise, you can also assert in Ajaro error when you're coming into a port and you must have noticed when you come into the port and the pilot is on port and he's taking the vessel into the port and he's heading for a leading line, especially when the vessel is aligned fore and aft line, through the fore and aft center line on the leading, leading light, the pilot will tell you, okay, captain, I think you have it one or two degrees of gyro error. Transits are formed when two charted objects are in line. They are often found marked on charts or in pilot books to give the clearance from the danger or a safe entrance into port. A single transit provides an accurate line of position and gets you halfway to an accurate fix. You just need to find where you are online. So basically it's a PL. You know you are on the track. And where you are, there, that's where you have to plot the position. But you are right, right on track, clear of the danger. But how far you are away from the leading lights or how away you are from the leading lights, that's where you have to plot the position. But one thing is for certain, uh, certain with the transit heading marks or leading lines is that you are on the right path. You are clear of the danger, especially when you, are, you have aligned the ship's fore and aft line, the forward mast. And of course, the half mass where you're standing just under that on the bridge, it's in the same line. That means you are heading directly into the leading lines. And as I said earlier, it also will help you to evaluate the gyro error. Once the vessel is aligned with the transit uh, heading lights or leading lines on the track, it also gives the gyro error with respect to the mark leads, which I talked about earlier. The cross transit, there are techniques how we had been using during a era when we did not have electronic aids for navigation. The best way to find out, uh, to find your position on transit is to find another one with a cross, uh, uh, which crosses it idly at about 90 degrees. This is tremendously accurate way to fix your position but you generally need to plan the fix beforehand also that it often use, is used to uh, give an accurate fix prior to starting the passage we'll talk about it let me read this the easiest way to is to find the charted transit or objects on the chart which form a suitable transit then to get uh, to plan position, pick up one of the transits and sail along with it, with it until the transit marks comes into the line. So, let's say this is the transit line and where you have taken a transit, but if you take and bearing as close as possible to 90 degrees, you get a good fix and good cut, which I will show you in the next slide as well. See here. The transit line, transit bearing is coming from here and there's a bearing taken here. So you know that you are somewhere on this line, but where you are, what I spoke earlier. So you take another bearing of an object. So you are somewhere on the PL, but where you are that you cross check with a bearing, let's, let's say this is 102.5 course. That is the vessel is staring, heading into 102.5 and then she takes a bearing almost 90 degrees and she fixes her position. So you're somewhere on the line of position or LOP and you take another bearing so you cross it and you get a position fix because your one PL is 100% correct as far as you are looking at the aft end of the bearing which you must have found that pilots once we are bringing the vessel out of the port uh, they come back to the wing, bridge wing and look at her stern and see that whether the, the vessel is in line or not. At that point in time, if you take a bearing, you get a fix, an accurate fix. Basically highlighting the practical knowledge of the seamanship. Now, significant tides or currents. Now here, I know many times, the second mates do not take the cognizance as far as the planning of the passage is concerned. Let me go through it first, then we talk about it. Tides are the rise and fall of sea level caused by the combined effect of moon, sun, gravitational forces, as well as Earth's rotation. 
tides adjust the depth of the sea <coughs> and create oscillating currents called tidal streams making tide prediction crucial for the coastal navigation that is tide go up and down whereas the currents go left and right just mark this thing it is similar to it like you know wind is the direction from which it comes and current is the direction when in which it sets so i repeat wind is the direction from which it comes and current is the direction in which in which it sets so tides go up and down and currents move left and right just bear this in mind to get your basics right types of tide semi diurnal tides every day semi diurnal tides excuse me semi diurnal tides every day a uh, semi diurnal tides cycle has two almost identical high tides and two low tides the tides between high and low tides is approximately 12 hours and 25 minutes this is based upon the lot of surveys what they have done the indian ocean is home to most of the semi diurnal tides the eastern african coast and the bay of bengal are two other common coasts with the semi diurnal tides now diurnal tides there are four tides in a day of di diurnal tides the sun produces two sides and the moon produces two spring tide is particularly high tide brought about the sun's complementary position in relation to moon because all these tides and everything is because dependent upon the moon phases because moon is the closest planet and of course sun so <clears throat> once we have a full moon you will have a very high tide and of course tide and tidal seems will be equivocally very strong at that point in time so it's worth noting that the surge occurs when the sun moon and earth are in same line there are two forms of surge when the moon and sun are on same side it is called conjunction and when the moon and sun are in opposite sides it is known as opposition we know in from a navigational aspects the magnitude of the tide would be of same in all those situations so the types of tide i'm talking about the semi -di diurnal tides the diurnal tides and let's talk about the next one mixed tides the tides <coughs> now these things are mainly on theory as well but this will help the candidates for the orals examination may be written also i'm not certain on that and of course when being interviewed by the wetting inspector as well mixed tides the mixed tide cycle or simply mixed tide is formed by a tide cycle of two unequal high and low tides <coughs> there are semi diurnal diurnal oscillation in this tidal cycle it can be found all over the gulf of mexico caribbean sea mixed tide can also be found along the brazilian coast in southeast spring tides the, the next is spring tides when the sun moon are in alignment and spring tides form pulling the ocean surface in the same direction a spring tide occurs as a high tide tides are higher and low tides are lower it happens twice a lunar month the name king tides has a tide has also been given to it <coughs> the next one comes of course last but not the least is neap tide the spring tide is followed by the neap tide which happens 7 days later 7 days later than the spring tide the fact that the sun moon are in right angle to each other in most noticeable feature the first and last quarter of the moon are often the this tide happens the moon gravitational pull and subsequent oceanic bulge are cancelled by the sun's gravitational pull and resulting oceanic bulge in addition in comparison to the spring tides the neap tides have a, uh, have lower high tides 
comparatively higher load types. So end of the day, I have explained you the different types of tides, especially five. Just to recapitulate, the semi-diurnal, diurnal tides, mixed tides, spring tides and neap tides. The thing is that when you are planning your passage, you must be aware of it and you must, especially second mates <coughs> and masters should also take cognizance of it. Uh, what are the tidal streams? Now, many a player times when we are in the coastal water, we experience the tidal streams, especially, you know, Singapore Strait, so many hours after high water or before high water, etc. Which is normally marked with the diamond on the chart, on the disc as well. But I found, honestly speaking, many navigators do not take a cognizance of it. And that is the reason I have come out with, you know, to describe this particular aspect. Tidal streams are horizontal flow of water caused by the rise and fall of the tide. The spring tide produces strong tidal stream and neap tides will produce relatively weak tidal streams. Tidal streams uh, repeat on a regular cycle for convenience and are related to the high water or at, at a standard port. That is what I said. That based upon the diamond, if you go to the ATT, You'll find everything is referred to the high with respect to the high water. The standard port will be a larger harbor such as Dover or Plymouth and will be noted on the chart on the tidal stream atlas. This is an example I've taken. The tidal streams information can be found on charts via tidal diamonds or in the booklets called tidal streams, atlases, tidal diamonds tabulate the tidal stream or a, uh, for a particular spot whereas a tidal stream atlas provides you with a complete overview of area covered. So if you see this particular diagram that is a tidal diamond here it is marked as G I have given an, ex an example everything is before high water after high water so the navigator shall calculate and mark it on chart especially the second image how many hours prior to the high water or after the high water you are arriving in that area and basis that you will get the tidal stream in the atlases. Today we have a lot of softwares which, which will cal help you calculate but first you need to ascertain that how many hours before or after high water you are arriving in this particular area that has to be done <coughs> before you arrive in that area, of course, subject to your ETA. So, ladies and gentlemen, I think we have spent about some time to talk about part two on the subject matter of comprehensive passage planning. I hope I have been able to narrate this perhaps in a comprehensive manner because I'm taking this subject very seriously. One, because myself being a master, I'm very strict on the passage plan. Number two, to help the mariners, especially second mates and masters sailing on board, to exercise due diligence. And number three, for the candidates who are preparing for the orals, do watch this. Perhaps it may help you. I will be coming up with part three, which will be safe speed, necessary speed alteration, changes in machinery spaces, uh, machinery space status, that is manned or unmanned, change in machinery status, that is standby for maneuvering, and change in bridge watch composition. I'm going to explain this in details. I will wait for your feedback so that I can basically prepare and formulate my this lecture because I took almost one month for a particular reason is that I had to make sure that 
what all are the doubts you now once i had all the doubts from my all followers then i you know assimilated all the data and accordingly you know progressed thank you good day stay safe bye bye please do like and subscribe my channel thank you.